Hello everyone, welcome to Open Democracy's weekly live discussion. I'm Mary Fitzgerald, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Open Democracy. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we're a global news outlet. Uh, we publish investigative journalism and high quality reporting analysis that seeks to challenge power and inspire change. Um, today, uh, we are teaming up with the After Lockdown series. So I'm very pleased to announce the chair for um, today's um, event, which is uh, Oliver Bullo, who's a journalist and author of Moneyland, Why Thieves and Crooks Now Rule the World and How to Take It Back fantastic uh, title for a book and topic for rich discussion. Um, just some housekeeping rules uh, um, uh, to start off with. Um, you can um, please do participate. This, this, um, this is supposed to involve all of you and thank you so much for questions that you submitted ahead of time. Um, we'll try and get to as many of those as we can and you can participate by uh, putting questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom um, window or if you're joining us on Facebook um, typing your uh, questions or comments into the participate function there. Um, the usual disclaimers, uh, this is uh, broadcast on a semi-lockdown, we may have unscheduled interruptions from uh, small children, pets, um, other ex unexpected visitors, apologies in advance if anything like that happens and please bear with us. Um, I'll hand it over to Oliver now to introduce our panel, thank you so much for joining. Um, thanks, Mary. Hello, everyone. Um, really good. Uh, well, not to see you, obviously. I rather wish I could see you, but to see uh, the number of attendees ticking up gradually. It's really good to know there's so much interest in this topic, which I think is a, an important and a uh, fascinating one. And we've got a pretty awesome group of people to talk about it today. Um, Susan Hawley, um, Director of Spotlight on Corruption, one of the UK's most respected anti-corruption voices. Uh, Spotlight on Corruption is quite a new organisation. Uh, Sue, could you give us a quick, very brief uh, resume about what Spotlight does and how can people find out about it? On mute. Um, thanks, Oliver. Yes, uh, Spotlight. So we're um, very focused on looking at whether the UK is actually taking any action on corruption, whether it's, it's enforcing its anti-corruption laws um, and uh, looking at how it, it, its role, basically, both in facilitating corruption globally, uh, but also uh, domestically. Uh, so we basically think that you know we have some good laws but we have very frankly quite weak enforcement and that is uh, quite across the board on lots of different levels and then we have directly below sue on my screen that heaven knows where he'll be on yours is peter gergen um investigations editor at open democracy uk and author of democracy for sale dark money and dirty politics i actually last week i had a copy of that to wave around which i haven't got with me at the moment is that on sale yet peter no, I don't have a copy of it to wave around either. It was supposed to be out today, would you believe? But it is one of the victims of the coronavirus. So it is now, it is out as an ebook today. So da -da -da -da, for all your ebook readers, but instead of that, it's now going to be out in early August in hard copy when there might be bookshops where people can go into and such like. So all the attendees should be going to their favorite evil multinational um, Indeed, book yes, of your choice. An evil multinational of your choice to either buy a, buy a copy now, a pre-order or to buy the ebook. Excellent. Well, it is a very good book. Um, I, can, I can tell everyone that dispassionately. And Heather Marquette, uh, to my left on this screen, is Professor of Development Politics at University of Birmingham, a fellow in the Institute for Global Innovation's 21st Century Transnational Organised Crime Research Cluster, which is a bit of a mouthful, but I think it means she knows an awful lot about transnational organised crime, which is very useful for our purposes, because we are going to be talking today about British corporate structures and their misuse by criminals around the world and why they have become the most popular getaway cars for stolen money pretty much anywhere and why that is and what we should be doing about it. We've already got a long list of questions which you've all sent in. Thanks very much. I've printed them out. Lots of themes coming up again. I'm going to get to them as we go along. But I thought we might start with Peter since you've written a lot about corporate structures in the UK um, and how they're misused. Could you mention um, Maybe a couple of couple of your investigations about what kind of things these uh, companies and partnerships are used for and what this means. Um, I mean, it, it sounds a little bit um, technical and perhaps a little bit, dare I say it, boring, but it really isn't. 
Yeah, I think that's the thing to the outside to when you start talking about things like limited partnerships and different types of liability and different tax jurisdictions, people do sound, maybe feel it's start to uh, start to drift off a bit. I guess the, the main thing I think takeaway with this is basically what we've seen over the last 15 to 20 years, I think, is that Britain has become a bit like what Swiss, the reputation that Switzerland used to have. The place where if you, you're a bit secretive, you've got a bit of dodgy money. The place to go really these days is Britain. And we've at Open Democracy done quite a few stories on this over the years. We did one, uh, myself, my colleagues, uh, David Leask and Richard Smith did a story recently about what are called Northern Ireland Limited Partnerships. And basically, this is a quite a fascinating story. So basically, out in the kind of far east of Russia, in a city called Nakoda, uh, out in, uh, I'm probably not even pronouncing it right, out in, uh, out in the kind of Siberian wilds, there was a nice big ship called the Winner. And uh, the Lots of the crew on the winner were having difficulties because they, they wanted to kind of get better terms and better conditions. But every time they tried to go to, uh, they went to the kind of the captain of the ship, the captain of the ship was like, well, I can't help you because, you know, I don't own the ship. And I like, well, who owns the ship? The kind of local union, like who owns the ship? And it turns out that the ship was actually owned by a company registered thousands and thousands of miles away in Belfast. Uh, in a little kind of a, in a place called Botanic Avenue, which is one of the nicer streets in, in South Belfast. And the reason why this was the case, why this company is registered all these miles away, was because it allows it basically the owners to be, to be secret. It allows um, the way limited partnerships originally were kind of the big secrecy drivers, thing called Scottish limited partnerships, which allowed for the people who actually the ultimate control is what we call the personal significant control to be secret. Uh, and as the rules around those started to tighten up, we've seen an increase in what are called English limited partnerships and Northern Irish limited partnerships. And so these really are vehicles that allow people thousands of miles away in places like Siberia to own property, to own things, to conduct business in a totally non-transparent way. And what was so fascinating about researching this story is we found lots of these companies. What you'll often find is thousands of them can be registered to the same address. And uh, we found loads in a place called Newry, which is another a small little, well, kind of small border town, really, on the other side of Dundalk and in, 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 in the United Kingdom side of the of the Irish border. And, you know, you talk to people in these towns and you ask them, did you know, like this little, this little, what well, is basically a hole in the wall has 10,000 companies registered at it. And they kind of go, no, what? That's crazy. And it can be, you know, in the case of one of these companies in Newry, about $700 million uh, from what was, what, what, what are called laundromats. But, you know, laundry, you get this kind of sense, cleaning, cleaning money. This big Russian laundromat operation, was about $700 million of this went through one of these firms that was in this small town of Newry as well and like what what's going on here and what I think people need to kind of understand really to understand what's happening with this is that people from re way outside Britain very easily can buy on the internet you can buy these companies so like some of these Northern Irish companies, quite hilariously, they're advertised in Ukraine, in, the, in lots of former Soviet Union states in Russia. And it's actually quite fascinating as well, even to see how like, the ads for them, they'll show little pictures of the Giants Causeway if they're Northern Ireland limited partnerships. And they also don't understand the difference between the different bits of Northern Ireland, or bits of the United Kingdom. So you'll have Northern Ireland limited partnerships with like a big flag of England. You know, because what they're really selling is the cachet of, of Britain. Because Britain, you know, a lot of people probably listening to this might have read about things like your book, Oliver. We know that like, when it comes to business, Britain's got a lot of, you know, skeletons in the closet, a lot of dirt that needs to be cleaned. But in places far away from Britain, Britain is seen as like it's, a, it's got cachet, like Switzerland did too. So that's the reason all these companies are starting to do this. But because of the way uh, it's structured, you know, we also actually at Open Democracy had a very interesting story recently. My colleague Tom Rowley was looking at this big development in the city of Tashkent in Uzbekistan. Huge, huge, big development. Uh, and what was happening there was, again, this a lot of this big development, very controversial, was all being funneled through a company that was actually situated in Rose Street, which if anyone's been to Edinburgh, you've probably had a drink on Rose Street. It's one of those streets that's full of bars and lots of tours. But down a little cubby hole there, the entire rebuilding of the city of Tashkent was being funneled through what are called the Scottish Limited Partnership. And that's been this big kind of thing over the last few years. And what's happened is, you know, as the reputation for these this kind of corporate structure goes internationally, more and more people are getting involved with it, and more and more people are kind of setting up as the people who can set you up in these things so you know someone might say well I got my company set up you know my dodgy company set up in Edinburgh through this guy you go to him and fascinatingly actually it's almost seeped into the culture of Scotland not to the rest of the United Kingdom but Scotland there was a very interesting very funny recent BBC series called Guilt which is worth watching a dark comedy great dark comedy at the heart of that was a Scottish limited partnership and a bunch of Russians who are funneling money through Edinburgh it's funny, I was doing a talk in, in London a while ago about um, corruption coming through the UK and talked about the misuse of British corporate structures. 
And afterwards, a young man came up to me who worked for the cabinet office. And he said, I don't, I don't understand. I thought, but we're really good at this, aren't we? I thought we were, you know, we, we really had this nailed. And I thought it's sort of alarming that people who, who, you know, at the central government had genuinely no idea of the extent to which we're complicit in corruption. Um, Sue, so you talk about this a bit. Why, why British, I mean, I understand Britain's got a certain cachet, you know, the Queen, the British Museum and stuff. Why um, is it so easy for criminals to use British structures to hide their identities when they commit fraud and financial crime? What's, what's happening here? Um, so, so it's actually very fascinating because Britain, in trying to be really open and one of the easiest places to do business, has tried to make it easier and easier to set up companies. So you have five kind of factors that companies house, uh, which is the, the main registry. The first is there are, there are no checks on applications. And uh, no you know, I mean, it's you, for a company. For, to set up a company. So, you know, we tried to set up a charity and we couldn't get, we weren't getting anywhere with the Charity Commission. We had this very dodgy geezer on our board called Oliver Buller, I don't know, you might have heard of him. And uh, he, uh, <laughs> uh, we, we couldn't get anywhere being a charity, so we tried to set up a company. Within four hours, we had a company. <laughs> and uh, uh, at, it was extraordinary to actually personally do it and see just how easy and quick and how few checks there are. Um, but I mean, it's, you know, there are people are in the mafia are using this. There was a great BBC documentary just back in February about this. You know, when the favorite, um, my favorite stories is how there was an Italian mafia guy and he put down as his profession in company's house that he was a truffatore, which means fraudster in Italian. And his address was an Italian number zero street of 40 thieves. Um, and so he was kind of playing with the system and the fact that there are no checks. Famously, actually, as Oliver has pointed out, and it's a brilliant long read, if anyone wants to see it, that's in The Guardian almost, uh, the only guy to be prosecuted in the UK ever for putting false information was a guy who tried to show how rubbish this was by setting up a, a firm called Cleverly Clogs, which was linked to James Cleverly, the minister, and then the Vince Cable Company Limited. Um, so, so the first one says no checks. Companies has, has no power to query, amend, or remove inaccurate information. And it's incredible. <laughs> they kind of, so they, even if they know there's something wrong, they can't do anything about it. There's no limit to the number of directorships someone can have. That's the third one. And, and the other thing, the fourth one I find amazing is there's actually no power to dissolve one of these limited partnerships that Peter was talking about. You, you can find out that they've been acting fraudulently, but they cannot be struck off or dissolved. Uh, and then finally, there's, you know, they have no power to share any suspicious information with law enforcement. So um, that is, you know, why we have, a, you know, what the, the key kind of money laundering watchdog in the world, FATAV, described our registry as largely unverified um, and uh, and that is why it is largely unverified and why it's so popular for people to come and set something up very quickly. Um, Heather coming to you uh, you are you've obviously been in the UK for quite a long time but you still have the accent of someone from from the other side of the Atlantic. Um, what the, the sort of Britain isn't what we think of as a tax haven, I suppose. We think of a tax havens as being smaller, possibly Caribbean jurisdictions, um, you know, not major economies, but that's a bit out of date. You know, what is it about the UK that attracts, you know, the international, you know, kleptocratic jet setting elite, do you think? You know, what are, you know, what have we got going on here? I mean, I think that, you know, when I think about the UK and what might make the UK a bit different and what also makes it really hard to imagine how things are going to change a lot is because the UK isn't just a place where people can store their dirty money but it's a really nice place for people to live as well for, for at least as long as they they can in terms of tax jurisdiction or so on and there's a couple of reasons I mean the first is you know I mean Sue was just talking about about things to do with the laws and you know how the laws aren't always implemented or so on but generally speaking you know the rule of law is strong here and there's a, a global reputation. So people might not care what the rule of law looks like in the places where they're making their money or they're stealing their money, but they certainly care about it where they're gonna live and where they're gonna put their families as well and where they keep their money. 
too. So when it comes to hiding and when it comes to living, the UK's got a good reputation. You know, there are great courts, uh, the, there are good, good policing, safe streets. Your property laws are going to be upheld. Your, your uh, assets are going to be lost to political or criminal rivals. The state's not going to take your assets and so on. So that would be the first thing. I'd say secondly, there's a lot of things about the UK social and cultural reputation as well. I mean, certainly pre-lockdown, and particularly in London, um, the UK is a great place for wealthy people to live. There's great theaters and museums and restaurants and nightclubs, and you know, shopping is absolutely world-class as well. Cities are open-minded and diverse. You've got great elite private schools and universities that are marketed to all the places where um, the, wealth, the global wealthy elite come from. Um, you can bring your family here and you can take them away very quickly too, because the UK is also really well connected. So all of these things make it really attractive for dirty money and clean but untaxed money to come in and for people to come with it. I guess the last thing is the political reputation as well. Um, and I'm not going to say much here, but certainly until recently, the UK's enjoyed this reputation for being really pragmatic, competent, sensible uh, citizens who aren't very politically engaged, who don't take to the streets and so on. And if you're talking about where people are coming from with dirty money, that looks really different to a lot of the countries that's coming from. And certainly I've been here since 1997, so I've never lived in a UK that hasn't bent over backwards to welcome dirty money into the, the country and until recently hasn't asked any sort of questions at all. And um, I actually got Peter's book today, so really looking forward to kind of getting a sense for the, the scale of the, the sort of political influence that that kind of money has bought over the last 20 years, regardless of party or, or politician. Peter, you, I mean, you've been, um, not just in your book, but in your articles, there's been some pretty remarkable revelations about um, the extent of the crime that's been enabled via the UK and by British complicity in these companies being created. I'm just wondering, do you get any um, sense that anyone cares? Do you know, do any politicians get in touch with you or, or, or regulators and say, you know, can you tell us more about this or let's do something about this? I mean, is it, is it a live issue for them or does it, is it like howling into the void? I think that's, you know, I think Sue's point, to speak to the, I think it is important almost if you're trying to, as a journalist, I think, you know, part of your job is to put information in public domain. But also, I think when you do this kind of journalism, I'm sure it's the same for you, Oliver, you do want to see these things change. You don't, you know, part of you like goes, well, I could keep telling the same story over and over for 20 years. You know, it's quite, you know, once you get used to it, it's not that difficult. But you would actually like to tell other stories. You'd like to see a bit of change, you know, change it up a bit. And I think we have, there's almost a two sides of it. There's a regulatory side and there is the political side. And one you know, the two things have to almost go hand in hand. Like the regulators, as you know, as Sue was, was talking about earlier, you know, Companies House is a, a reactive, completely reactive regulator. It's not in any way, and that's the way it's designed. It's not designed as a proactive regulator at all. These companies that we're talking about, actually, fascinatingly, can sit dormant. They're almost like some sort of sleeper cells. They can sit dormant for years and then reanimate themselves because they can't be written off. You know, you can reanimate them at any time. So, from the regulator side of it, there's definitely. You know, and I think if you talk to regulators, I think, you know, I'm surprised your experience at the cabinet office. If you do, if you talk to people who are involved with the regulators themselves, I do think they do understand this and would like, most of them would like something to change. I think they can see the problems. They can see the challenges that like the system as is, uh, is constant constitutes but a lot of them are still hamstrung by what's you know what's possible and um, a lot of them are scared of regulatory overreach as well we saw the attacks on the electoral commission which is a different body but this week you know, the, the telegraph was saying that we should get rid of the extra commission like there's a sense in which if regulators seem to be in any way involved beyond what you know anything that's vaguely political they will get jumped upon so i think regulators are, are, are squeamish and when it comes to political will i think there hasn't been a hell of a lot of it, really. A lot of it's been at the back benches, especially in the parties of government. You know, we had David Cameron talking very tough on clamping down on, you know, on tax avoidance and on, on like, forcing one of the big changes to uh, people of... Uh, Persons of significant control sounds a bit technical, but basically companies have to say who controls them. We will have a story on Open Democracy next week that's on a big data dive of all the companies' house registrations and is revealing there's a huge number of missing PSEs, people of uh, persons of significant control, which means you don't know who owns the company, and that's not illegal, and there's nothing really wrong with it. And be honest with you, the company's house has got very limited things that they can do about it. I am 
hopeful in some ways. I see Annalise Dodds is now the shadow um, shadow chancellor. In the past, she has spoken quite. She was very vocal about Scottish limited partnerships for quite a while. Um, I think that's good. I think there's a need for like it to be a far more like kind of broad church to talk about political funding though as well. Like the problem in some respects is we. Uh, political funding is in the United Kingdom an individual thing really especially outside of you know, the Labour Party relies mainly a lot on unions has done for a while that might change with Keir Starmer but in general the other two parties the Conservatives Liberal Democrats and others do rely on individual donors and I think there's there's a difficulty there because a lot of political donors you can't a lot of political donors do have a, an interest in the financial world and in maintaining the kind of all sort structure so there isn't really the political will behind it so while people like us might write stories about it there's the kind of there's also the challenge i think as well as to tell to un, for people to kind of get why this matters why there is a victim at the end of this because it can sound a little bit victimless you know okay we're moving money around but like you're not really seeing how actually in other countries and even in the united kingdom too this is taking money out of the hands of actual real people there is an actual victim at the end of this it's not just it's financial chicanery but there's also something there's also actual human hardship that at the end of it, whether that's loss of tax revenue, which means that countries can't do things that they might be able to do, or actually, you know, even worse things. So I think there's, there's a the challenge, I think, is to try and narrate for people why this really matters. I feel like the, there's been a, there was a moment a few years ago where we were starting to get there in Britain. There was a bit more movement, especially around tax justice, which is connected to this. I think the kind of, you know, people were starting to go, actually, hang on, why is Amazon able to be domiciled in Ireland and just pay like basically a peppercorn rent on what it does in the United Kingdom? Why is Facebook paying less tax than I am? You know, that sort of thing. So we were starting to get there. I do feel like we, we that some of the momentum behind that has shifted, has kind of dropped away. And hopefully maybe lockdown is an opportunity for us to kind of try and rev some of it back up again. Ma Martin Miller has pointed out in the, in the comments um, that entirely correctly that, that cut, there are changes to the way companies house is going to be run i um, mean it will become a bit more of a uh, i suppose a little bit more of a regulator and a bit less of just a library um from information so can you talk a bit about what's being changed and whether you think that will be um good will that help yeah so um the government did a consultation last summer which closed last august um and they made a number of recommendations uh uh, and a lot of them are really good. They're about verifying people. So, and they, you know, they discovered it's incredibly cheap to verify people. It's only about between two and six pounds, you know, per person to actually verify them. Uh, and uh, they are also go looking at striking off limited partnerships, uh, which is good. Um, but the main problem is that um, it needs primary legislation. So as we know, you know, we were waiting for a new government and then we were waiting for Brexit and now we've got coronavirus and there is no new legislation going through Parliament. Um, they, they'd already signalled there wasn't going to be any new legislation because of Brexit. Uh, now you've got, you know, coronavirus is going to take out this year. If Brexit then takes out next year, we might be looking at the end of 2021 before we get the legislation that actually um, does something about this. And, and but. I wonder whether coronavirus is actually going to impact that. I mean, we're hearing, you know, the, the concerns that people are actually setting up companies to get government bailouts um, and using that kind of fraudulently. Uh, so whether if that kind of information comes out, it might kind of um, spur greater political change. But I think there are also some weak spots in what they're recommending. So one of the key things that we find when we're investigating companies, and you must have the same, Peter and Oliver, is that you try to find out who owns them and it's a company who is owned by a company who goes offshore. Um, and the only thing they're kind of suggesting to do about that is that when companies are owned by other companies in another jurisdiction, they'll say who regulates that uh, jurisdiction <laughs> or that company in that jurisdiction which doesn't seem to me like that's going to do much good because if you know if you've ended up in the bvi or in the isle of man um you know then it's going to be a problem i mean i think the key thing here is that the uk has actually committed to being a leader on beneficial ownership transparency and really saying who's behind companies and it knows that it's really problematic for them to go out and say everyone should have these registers when its own register is so fundamentally flawed and weak. So I think there will be ongoing pressure to do something about this. 
So I would just want to I, I repeat a little bit of what Peter was saying about Annalise Dodds. I have a, um, a slight um, hero worship issue with Annalise Dodds, but partly because she quoted one of my articles in the House of Commons, but mainly because she's a real nerd when it comes to companies' house reform, and all the best people are nerds when it comes to companies' house reform. So I think she gets it. So who knows, if she were to become ch chancellor, maybe that would solve the problem. Um, uh, interesting question from Graham Martin sent in in advance, Heather. Just with regard to this, sort of in the, since after lockdown is the, the theme of what we're talking about, um, how can we resist the, the narrative that we need to go to be more Singapore on Thamesy after COVID in order to get the economy moving? Um, you know, there will inevitably be a debate after lockdown that what we need is less red tape, not more red tape, that this kind of you know, extra checks on, on identity of, of the company owners is just, just sand in the wheels of business and et cetera. Um, you know, what can we, how can we tell a story that, that, that shows that actually these kind of anonymous companies are doing tremendous damage and this isn't just, you know, good entrepreneurs, you know, doing good entrepreneurial stuff? I mean, I, I think that um, afterwards, and I've, I've written about this recently, that you know the cost of the bailout is going to be so high that I think the way that some people are talking about it right now is it's almost like there's a little there's a room somewhere that's called pre-COVID and we could just go back to normal afterwards. And actually what we've already seen just in the short amount of time is that that different rules are going to have to apply. And I had to laugh when Peter said about a political will, because I have this um post-it next to my, my desk. Um, so I do this exercise with the students about why poverty exists in the 21st century and always it's lack of political will, but what does it mean and how do you, you get it? And I think that there's also, you know, what's become really clear is all the cracks. I mean, I, you know, I work in international development, you know, the cracks in the system that were there before COVID and are now really clear, you know, the fiscal, the political, the social cracks and so on are becoming apparent and you can see, you know, there's all this money offshore, tax revenues, profits that aren't being reinvested in wages or in expansion, you know, public budgets being stolen or misspent or so on, all sitting offshore, you know, going into UK property and restaurants and all of that kind of stuff. But there's a real cost and the cost comes when it comes to the kind of public systems that we absolutely depend on. You know, and you can see certainly in developing countries, you can see the decades of underinvestment, things going offshore and, and lack of taxes but you see it in health now really um really obviously in nigeria you know a country that has had tremendous oil wealth um that has been squandered for a long time um there's been a lot of op-ed pieces uh coming in about you know well now the nigerian elite get to sit back and enjoy the wonderful health system that their money hasn't paid for um, under lockdown because there's no way to escape and questions being asked about whether or not there will be the political will to change that going forward. And I guess a lot of that will depend on what happens here in the UK and elsewhere. If you're gonna go back to business as usual and do even more deregulating and making it even easier, um, there might be a real lost opportunity. I think the kind of the political impacts elsewhere, I think the political impacts ha happen here as well, but there's, there's something there about integrity and good governance and so on that this just undermines by its very nature. So secrecy is not good. It's transparency and accountability are really the heart of good politics. And these sorts of systems really do undermine those. The fact that they also facilitate organized crime and terrorism and extremism and so on, I just can't get my head around that we would allow systems to exist that facilitate those kind of bads. And Finally, just on the social consequences, this sounds really silly, but one of the big social consequences, I think here and everywhere, but in developing countries too, is these kind of social consequences around this big global wealthy elite um, who spend a lot of time showing off their hidden money on Instagram and social media and so on and create this kind of, this sense that in order to be successful and powerful and so on, you have to look a certain way, drive certain cars or so on. I've, I've seen it in India in field work that we did about attitudes towards corruption with the number one justification for corrupt action was that you need to buy stuff for your kids and you need to be seen to be successful. I saw it in Jakarta where you're walking on, you know, awful sewage strewn sidewalks, but you're next to a Bugatti dealership and Chanel and all of that kind of stuff. 
Um, in Ghana, you know, cybercrime is being fueled by so-called Instagram millionaires uh, and so on. And I think it comes through Oliver in your book really well. There are these stories and stories of this. And, you know, if you can't afford it, you charge it. If you can't charge it, you steal it. And ultimately, it's, it's you know, just buying a lot of stuff to project. And it's that, that social thing as a parent, I think, that to me is one of the consequences um, with COVID, maybe that will change um, as more of us don't have as much money to buy stuff or charge stuff as well. Um, there are some talking of Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, there are some good questions coming in on Facebook, which I'm going to come to in a minute. But there's a good one on the Q&A from Kai Holden, who I think is in Gdansk. I think there was a Kai in Gdansk earlier. Um, hello, Kai in Gdansk. Um, he says, I imagine a number of politicians have fortunes they prefer not to have taxed, so it would not be in their personal interest to enforce strict laws on hidden money. We won't go into that for uh, defamation purposes, but um, it does tie into one of the themes of your book, Peter, about the fact that certainly um, the referendum campaign and also various political campaigns have relied on uh, murky corporate structures. And I wonder, I mean, you know, is there an element of self-interest in this, in politicians not, politicians not wanting to take action because it might inconvenience political funding, or is that just being cynical? Well, I think it's quite hard not to see some element. You know, political parties in the UK do need to keep funders happy to continue operating. That's just a fact of life. We have, it's kind of something we don't really want to talk about, but that's just reality. And if you don't have large donors, if you don't have... If you're not able to keep your donors sweet, whether your donors are trade unions or rich benefactors, you, you will be in serious trouble. So it is actually very important. And what you've seen, you know, we've seen a shift in political funding in the UK in recent years where, you know, what traditionally the UK, uh, political parties, particularly Conservative Party are the party of moneyed funders in Britain for obvious reasons. And that's just the nature of it. The Labour Party are mainly funded by trade unions and smaller parties taking money from other places. And over the last 30 years, the changes in or 40 or 50 years, the change in political funding for the Conservative Party have mirrored the change in the British economy. So it went from, as the City of London became more and more of a thing, the um, funding from the city became a, a larger and larger aspect. I think when David Cameron started as Conservative leader, whenever I was 2003, I think about a quarter of their funding came from the City of London. Within 10 years, it was was over half. That's actually increased more and more uh, in recent years. And more and more political funding comes from people who are involved in the hedge fund world, uh, people who are involved. And that's just that's just a fact. I don't think it's about wanting to short Sterling or something. But what you do get from that is people who have a, an interest in secrecy, in, by their nature, in keeping corporate structures as they are. You know, there are not people who will want to see change in corporate structures. So there's a kind of, there is definitely an imbalance there. And, you know, there's been some reporting recently about the Aaron Banks case. Um, um, Aaron Banks was reported by the Electoral Commission uh, to the National Crime Agency because of donations he'd made during the referendum. The Electoral Commission last week uh, basically pulled out its case and said, look, we're, we uh, has basically apologised to Mr. Banks. Mr. Banks was found not to have in any way uh, funded money illegally into the campaign. But what the National Crime Agency did find was what had happened was the money for the campaign came from another company that Mr. Aaron Banks owned in the Isle of Man. Um, and under electoral law, you're not supposed to fund political campaigns from outside the United Kingdom. That's a kind of key tenant of electoral law. A lot of British electoral law is supposed to stop foreign money coming in. But in this instance, the NCA found that it was Mr. Banks' money, but it was coming from the Isle of Man, so that was kind of okay. And I think there's a worrying aspect of kind of where we're going in terms of, which is actually, instead of going towards more transparency, we're probably going in the opposite direction in terms of more opacity. So because it's kind of basically the green light to say it's okay to fund money through, as long as your own money if it comes from offshore. And that then now opens us into this world where it is much more opaque, so it's hard to see where money comes from. So it's hard to avoid the sense in which you know, like we're not actually getting towards a place where there's more transparency around political donations, we're probably going backwards. That's alarming. Um, so, I mean, that brings us to a question that came up a lot in the questions sent in advance about how to mobilise some form of sort of political movement to do something about this. Um, Sue, you literally created Spotlight on Corruption in order to try and uh, advocate for changes to, to the UK to make us less corrupt and more open. Um, what's the plan? How are you going to do it? <laughs> what's the plan? We need, well, <laughs> so it's extremely challenging circumstances. And I do think that, you know, there's been a, a lot of distraction uh, from, you know, Brexit and now coronavirus, and that it's quite hard to get your voice heard. But like, there are seeds in government that, you know, and there are good people in government, you know, there's a whole unit 
of 20 people working on corruption uh, who were beavering away. And so I don't feel completely hopeless, you know, that there aren't the right people who can listen and push forward proposals, but it is about trying to get the attention of kind of the people who are running the, the country. And it's hard because I was just looking back, you know, the Danske Bank scandal, it was the biggest money laundering scandal ever. And they found that a company it was just a month before the scripple poisoning, a company linked to Putin's family had been set up in London at company's house. And you would think that would, you know, that was more than two years ago now, you would think any sane country would emergency legislation to sort this out. But there's there's this kind of inertia and slowness, and it's partly because of the, the, the political distraction that's been going on for the last few years. Um, but I think partly it is this kind of, this is we've got to be a business friendly country. Uh, we don't want to scare too much business away. Um, and uh, so, I, I mean, I don't know, which is whether it's more of one and more of the other. But I, I, I mean, I think the, the danger is with coronavirus that a lot of these things um, are going to be very shaky afterwards because the economic crisis is going to be so severe that that will be the excuse for not doing anything. I mean, it, it could work the other way around, Heather, in a way. I mean, you know, the sort of underpinning of kleptocracy for decades has been the fact that your money moves seamlessly and you can go and spend it wherever you like. Obviously, because of COVID-19, that is no longer the case. As you mentioned, you know, Nigerian politicians can no longer come and be treated for their many ailments in London hospitals. Their children can't come to school in the UK. You know, the mobility has stopped. Can, do you think this will, I mean, could, could this be a moment when you know, we can try and rebuild things without that. I mean, I don't know, it, it, I'm grasping at straws here. I mean, this comes to that political will question and how do you get it? And I mean, I think that what, what Sue's been doing um, with Spotlight and Corruption is really important because it's about, well, how do you actually push? How do you get political will? Because it's not gonna, it, it won't just happen for all sorts of reasons. And you've talked a bit about incentives and so on. And partly there might be a reputational issue so, you know, thinking about, you know, the, the UK has made a lot about its soft power over the years and its reputation for soft power is undermined by these sorts of issues. So if you talk about things like fairness, so British values, fairness, integrity, rule of law, stability, or so on, it's very easy then for governments elsewhere to turn around and say, you know, but what about all the dirty money? What about the city of London? I literally was locked in a taxi cab by a Ugandan taxi driver here in the UK when I was talking about some research we'd done on Uganda where it looked like bribery might have reduced a bit in a sector. And he wouldn't let me out until he told me why corruption was never going to stop in, in Uganda because of British banks hiding all of the, the money and so on. Um, I mean, that affects the, the soft power. There's also the security issues as well. And I think this is when you've talked about backbench MPs and others and kind of potential coalitions of change. It's really thinking about, you know, you've got the, the injustice issue from tax and the fact that we are going to have to invest in in also, I mean, universities, hospitals, I mean, so much is going to have to happen with the economic crisis to come. Well, where is that going to come from? It can't come from the likes of us because there isn't that much left to give. So where will you find it? That might be a, there's the security issue. So organized crime is a growing problem in the UK, and this is not going to make it less so. Um, now with, with all the opportunities for organized crime with COVID as well. So if you're a security person, then there are real incentives to actually do something um, about this as well. And I think that those, you know, the reputation issue is also important. So Britain's reputation as a place for safe investment depends on having rule of law and good structures and so on. I just, just finally, with, with the things that you know, Sue and Peter have been talking about, if I, if I were talking about a, a developing country, I would say, you know, don't look at the laws on anti-corruption, look at the money that goes into implementation. And I think what you've seen up until now is a real sign for where the political will hasn't been there. So, you know, making the changes is great. In order to implement them, you need to invest in, in that. Um, and so far that hasn't, there hasn't been enough investment behind that. So going forward, will you see more investment in these regulations? Um, I'm not sure. In my world, the, the post-COVID closed door, there's a lot of stuff going on behind there that we don't really know yet to make guesses.
but the only way I can think it's going to change is if people like us and attendees are really pushing for that change. Just say, uh, Christopher Peters has asked in the Q&A about the Putin family company um, and uh, the Danske Bank connection. Um, that was, uh, uh, it was revealed by Howard Wilkinson, uh, the whistleblower who revealed the Danske Bank money laundering scandal. Um, it was Danske Bank's branch in Tallinn, Estonia. Um, uh, I think the company's called Lantana Trade LLP. Uh, you can look it up on Company's House. It was, uh, it owned um, an account at Danske Bank that was moving huge volumes of money and yet in the accounts of the company itself, it was essentially a, a, a dormant company, supposedly making no money at all. And, and, and this was one of the things that made Howard Wilkinson suspicious, which is why he blew the whistle on Danske Bank and revealed the biggest money laundering scandal the world has ever seen, in which the largest group of account holders were British shell companies. And that fact has, as far as I know, been mentioned zero times in the House of Commons, which is kind of amazing, really. Britain is a key enabler of the biggest money laundering scandal of all time. I, I think 750 times more money moved by Danske Bank than by HSBC for the drug cartels. So, you know, go figure, I suppose, which does suggest a, a bit of a lack of interest from our um, political masters, which is a little bit alarming. Um, Peter, you're, um, uh, you write a lot about the sort of corporate, uh, the, the fraud aspect of this, the financial crime aspect of this. Um, why do you think there's no... It, it seems extraordinary to me why there isn't more political interest in these issues, considering how they affect the most vulnerable people in Britain and elsewhere. Um, is, that, is that something you have insight into? Why, why do people not care more? I think it's, I'm actually just working on a story for, some, for Sunday uh, about, it's not, a, well, it's slightly politically connected, somebody who's political donor is involved, and it's, it's, it's to do with, you know, who's gone into business with a man who's a convicted fraudster. Um, and there's a kind of issue, I think, ab about because fraud is notoriously difficult to prosecute. It's a very hard case to prosecute. A lot of fraud prosecutions don't end up in convictions. Um, Procurator Fiscal in Scotland, uh, CPS, are, are, are reluctant to take fraud cases. And what I think ends up a lot of time is, I was talking to a regulator, a pensions regulator today, and I was just chatting to him about another case, and I was saying, you know, what, what happens? You see the same names over and over again. So, yeah, we see the same names over and over again. And I see it, you see it, we all see it in the work we do. You see the same people popping up time and again. And when you see them, you go, okay, something's happening here. And I think the reason why that, one of the reasons why is because, you know, fraud is is a thing that isn't, is quite, it's, there's a reasonable expectation of not getting away, of getting away with it. Um, because it's so difficult to prosecute, because there is a kind of culture of really of non-prosecution, unless it's deemed to be really, really going to happen, you know, it's going to be a slam dunk victory. And also, unless there's going to be a significant amount of money on the other side of it. So all of those things are kind of in the favor of people who are going to be fraudsters. And um, so there isn't really a need, of, there isn't really the kind of, because in the absence of cases, I think cases would also help, or you had criminal prosecutions that were actually going to trial and, point and convictions, that would also force political energy. But in the absence of those kind of, you know, in the absence of, of, of kind of high profile fraud cases going to court, going people ending up in prison, you're not getting, I think, the same kind of upstream in terms of politics of politicians been forced to say, well, actually, well, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do with the system that allows this? So it can look a bit, because if we don't, you know, the regulation, right, as you, and I think, you know, that point that was made earlier is totally key like yeah like that header was saying about in say in nigeria or something yes you can look at like what's written on a statute book but actually it's the norms of what's going on that really uh, that are really important so you know the cps crime Pro uh, the crime prosecution service might have a bunch of like kind of guidelines on what it's going to do with fraud but the reality of how those norms you know how those guidelines are interpreted what the norms are around prosecutions i think are really determining so in the absence of seeing those kind of cases going to trial and high profile cases going to trial and, and ending up in convictions there isn't the same political will there might be if we were seeing that can i to add something there on yes, that which is a really yeah. important point and i think just uh, just back in january you know key uh, judgment came out about the Barclays case, which was the only fraud case ever to come out of the 2008 financial crisis. And a lot of people are making these comparisons between now and that crisis in terms of, you know, what's going to happen afterwards? Is it going to be more austerity? But, you know, the, the key judgment was that it is not possible to prosecute a large bank or a large financial uh, institution for fraud. So you have a level of impunity, which, which I find extraordinary that people aren't jumping up and down and saying, this is outrageous, a, a bank cannot be prosecuted 
for defrauding people, nor can a big uh, contracting company like G4S take it, you know, who are getting contracts for the COVID uh, emergency procurement. If they were to defraud the government, they cannot be prosecuted. You know, so I think Peter's point is really, really important. And it's not just they can't be prosecuted, but you know, their directors uh, are, can't be prosecuted either. And there's a kind of sense in the courts you know, that basically white collar criminals are treated very differently. They rarely get convicted. Uh, and and you know, I've heard anecdotal evidence of that, of you know, judges saying that they felt sorry for these white collar defendants. So they kind of you know, stop the trial, or find some way of stopping it. And that's incredibly damaging, I think, to public confidence in the UK system as a, a fair place where everyone plays by the same rules because they don't. I'm, um, I'm keeping a, a, a beady eye on the clock here because um, I don't want to run into everyone's tea time. Um, I thought we might try and get some sort of practical suggestions. Um, um, Heather, I'm making you um, minister for... Um, company regulation um, post lockdown. Um, what, what, what's, what do you do? What's, give, me a, give me a concrete policy to make things better, to make Britain's impact on the world less um, malicious. Um, I think that I would be looking to pulling together as many um, allies as I could across, across parties, across different sorts of, you know, connecting together some big campaigns as well, linking it to things like climate and other thing, and to say, actually, we really need to invest in getting these systems functioning. Um, because if we don't, actually, the impact on, on our security is going to be really, really stark. And I think, I mean, I'm looking at some of the Q&A here about, you know, continuation of dirty or untaxed money and, and so on. And I just, I feel like I don't have enough of a handle on what's, what's going on because people will compare this to 2008 or to Ebola or to the 1980s or something like that. There's nothing like this. So thinking about what's happening in the US for unemployment figures, for example, well, that's going to affect the amount of money that's going around. It. You know, there, there's so many different factors you just can't possibly say. So the thing is, is to really put emphasis on getting the, the nitty gritty systems right so that you have a chance of actually doing something. And I think, you know, Peter talked about it being a bit boring in the beginning, but actually the, the kind of nitty gritty boring bits are the things that are the most important to do and to do well and to invest in. And it's how you convince a public that it's worth that, it's, it's worth doing that. Peter, how do we convince the public that, we, that that's worth doing? You can be, um, uh, you're, you're a, a waiver allowing you to serve in the British government despite being an Irishman. Um, your minister for sorting this out. Um, what do you do? I, I guess I, I from I do think a huge part of it like, is something that's running through this is like the idea of alliances and the idea of lots of different people need to be on side with this. I think that's I think that is really really important. I think you know I look upon it maybe I would struggle a bit to think about myself as a British government minister. I don't. I think it's like I think it is that. He, like part of its law change it's good to see reformer companies house and all the rest of it but i think there has to be something much bigger i think it also has to be something that's almost like a, a kind of national conversation around this in which people you know partly as a journalist you're trying to narrate this you're trying to you know trying to kind of show people how this works you know i was just um i was watching i was saying oliver i was watching before the start i've been watching a series on netflix ozark which is all about money laundering and it is fascinating to watch someone quite interestingly narrate how money laundering works it's great it's really interesting and i think we've lacked doing that like you know i kind of want to see a spooks that tells you about these guys you know it shows people how this world works like it's really fascinating too like you know oliver's book is full of absolutely fascinating anecdotes you know and this world look like i operate in and you we all operate in where you know recently i was looking at a, a conservative party funder who just appeared out of nowhere and given about a hundred thousand pounds and I, I found the address of his company it was i i stay in finchley in london and i was um so they go down for a run literally down the road to try and find it. And you kind of come to a little box next to the Tesco where 50 or 60,000 companies are registered. Like, that's crazy. And I think people are really interested by that. When you tell them about it, they're interested. And I think there's, there's, that's part of the job as well as to try and narrate for people how this wild wor world works. So and I think that's, you know, that might sound like, because I think we know what we could, we know what 
change would look like practically. I think that's not, it's not impossible to see how change could happen. Yes, when you close up one loophole, others will open. So when, like, like we reported earlier this year, when the Scottish Limited Partnerships started, that started being squeezed. You saw it happening in Northern Ireland and England. But one of the reasons that was was because we didn't bring in the same legislation about um, PSCs in, in England and Northern Ireland. If you'd done that for all those places, that wouldn't have happened. You know, it's not necessarily absolutely rocket science. You know, obviously gaps will appear, some people will be unscrupulous. That's always going to be the case. But the harder you make it, the less people will get through that net when it's as easy as it is now. And you can just buy an off-the-shelf company for 20 euros on the internet from Ukraine or Russia that's a, you know, a British secrecy vehicle. Well, people are going to do that. Um, Sue, so, um, let's have two minutes worth of, of concrete proposals to make Britain a less crooked place. Um, well, I mean, some of them are already in there, like Peter says, the company's house thing, that just needs to be done urgently, you know, corporate liability reform, make companies uh, prosecutable. Uh, you know, these are simple things, but, you know, they need legislation, uh, you know, they need that elusive political will. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think there's, it's pretty easy to come up with the five top things, you know, and we've got two of them there, but it's, it's how we connect them to those stories that Peter's talking about and use those stories in the press to really kind of push change ahead and make people realise that this is, you know, this is what's common sense. This isn't weird and wacky. This is how things should be for normal. Mary has reappeared on my screen, which I think means our time amongst you is over. Um, hello, Mary. Welcome back. <laughs> Hello, Oliver. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for an absolutely fascinating uh, discussion. Um, that was incredibly enjoyable. I learned a lot. Um, and I'm going to pick up the theme, as is my job, to point out that if we need powerful storytelling about these issues in order to mobilise public opinion, then we need solid, reliable, vivid, compelling public interest journalism, the types of things that Oliver and Peter and, and many others uh, do well. So if you've enjoyed this discussion uh, and you think it's important to continue investigating these issues, please consider supporting Open Democracy. Um, you can do so at support.opendemocracy.net forward slash donate. Um, and either way, uh, I'd really encourage you to sign up if you haven't already to our newsletter, um, opendemocracy.net forward slash Corona Crackdown, where we're monitoring uh, the ways in which rights and freedoms and transparency um, is being curtailed uh, as a result of uh, coronavirus. Um, thank you again to the wonderful panelists. Next week, we're going to have a discussion about the human, the human rights situation in Libya. If you sign up to our newsletter, you can get more details about all of that. Um, and I hope you all have wonderful evenings. Goodbye. See you soon. Thank you.